Nice to see you. Um, so, how many of you had a chance to uh, look at the uh, um, <coughs> the uh, film that I sent out uh, to you? Um, I think it was a, a, a nice piece. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, uh, I certainly recommend it. Some of those things are better than others. I thought that was a, a really good one, particularly because, as you know, uh, this is a fairly complicated story. 82 years from the beginning to the end, from the event uh, with uh, uh, the, the train um, and the accusations of rape, uh, the very first trials, until the final pardon uh, by the then governor of Alabama, Parr Duns, in 2013, 82 years. What kind of justice is it that we have? Uh, so, 82 years. It's a little, also a little difficult to count the proceedings. That is to say, the number of trials, the number of appeals, the number of um, uh, appearances before the parole board uh, in, in uh, Alabama. It's difficult, uh, I think, to know exactly whether the appeals board met separately for each one of the defendants. I think they probably did. But um, it, it would appear that there were some 26 different legal proceedings, not including the parole board meetings. And there must have been dozens of those if we count them um, seriatim, i.e. individually, because they were up for parole, uh, the individual uh, guys were up for parole for a number of years. Uh, they would keep going up for parole, and they would uh, continue to get denied. In any event, uh, it's, there aren't too many Fortunately, there aren't too many cases, quote unquote, um, that stretch out that long. Um, but one of the things that I think is kind of interesting uh, is that some of the issues, a couple of the key issues, raised in those cases are with us today as we speak, literally as we speak, because there are two trials going on today and this week, one in Kenosha and one in Georgia, I forget exactly where, um, that basically raise very similar uh, issues. Uh, in addition, as you know, there were three Supreme Court cases, um, in one in 1932 and two in 1935, uh, that uh, <clears throat> basically sent uh, the results of those particular trials back to the court uh, in uh, Alabama. So in 1935, the Supreme Court ruled, uh, as you'll remember, uh, that <clears throat> in the selection of jurors uh, that you could not discriminate on the basis of race. Surprise, right? Surprised everybody in Alabama. Uh, surprised everybody in a lot of other places. That same year, the very same year, 
The Supreme Court ruled in another case that in the state of Texas, they could deny blacks registering in the Democratic primary in the very same year. And that decision wasn't overturned until 1944. And the basis for that decision, if you read the decision, was that the Democratic Party was a quote, unquote, private organization. That was a unanimous decision by the then Supreme Court. Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's nothing else to say except that's it. Just put it out there and, you know, let it lie there. So, um, in 19, uh, 64, I don't know how many of you remember this, but at the uh, Democratic National Convention in 1964, there was a big fuss about seating delegates from the state of Mississippi. A young man named John Lewis led a delegation of all black delegates from the state of Mississippi and that delegation was there with another delegation that was an all-white delegation. And there was a terrific brouhaha at the convention. And um, <clears throat> Hubert Humphrey um, and uh, Roy Wilkins and a bunch of other important people in the party came together to try and work this out somehow. And they proposed a compromise, quote unquote. Um, and the compromise was, I think that they, the Democrats were entitled to something like 65 delegates at the convention. It was something close to that number. And the compromise they proposed was that the black delegation would seat two delegates and the white delegation would seat 63 delegates. <laughs> I'm not making this up. So that didn't fly very well with Mr. Lewis. And in the end, uh, they basically uh, disappeared. They were quote unquote guests of the convention, but they couldn't vote. And the Alabama um, uh, delegation had issues as well. So um, here we are um, in 2021. And, and then let me just say one other thing. In 1965, we had the Civil Rights Act. And in 20, excuse me, 2006, that act, as I think I said last week, uh, was re, um, uh, <clears throat> re upped by the Congress with a vote of 96 to nothing in the Senate and 400 and something to three in the House. And then, a few years ago, Chief Justice Roberts uh, wrote an opinion uh, which basically gutted the Civil Rights Act. Um, and here we are today in 2021. We have the John Lewis Bill. We have a, another Civil Rights Bill a voting bill, not a civil rights bill, a voting bill. And I raise the question to you, what's going to happen to those bills? Where are we with those bills? 
we have one thing that's happened in the last week, which I know we all have heard about, was that Congress, uh, the House, finally passed the infrastructure bill, which the Senate had passed, as you know, some time ago. And apparently, the um, president is waiting until next week to sign the bill because the, the Congress is not in session, which is more common than not. <laughs> and um, so he wants, in many respects, it's understandable, to have the photo opportunities that appropriately might go along with the signing of this bill. Then, of course, we have the other bill, uh, the soft infrastructure bill, uh, if you will. But we also, in the background, have these other two bills, uh, the uh, voting rights bill, the John Lewis bill, and the other one. And so, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts here. I mean, coming forward, if we go all the way back to this case, and of course others, uh, with regard to jury selection, a, a case that was decided uh, in the court that very same year about blacks being excluded from the primary. Of course, the Democratic primary then was the Republican primary reversed because all those Democrats became Republicans. When? They became Republicans in 1965 when the Voting Act was passed and they all left the Democratic Party and went to the Republican Party. And of course it's been that way ever since. So uh, I think that's a, uh, an interesting question. And uh, uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to entertain any comments uh, or thoughts that you had on that. Uh, yes, Joe. I had a, a question, and that's in connection with the selection of the jury in the Arbery case. Yes. The, the judge has looked at the outcome of the selection and said that it looks like discrimination, racial discrimination to me with only one black juror. Yeah. Right. Um, but that I'm helpless to do anything about it. Uh, Mistrial. Can, can, can you describe the process that, that uh, ties the hands of a judge in that circumstance? I think I know it depends on the adversarial uh, right. process by defense and prosecution. I, I thought that was a, you know, uh, I thought that was an, an odd comment to make. Uh, I don't know to what law he was referring, if he was referring to a, a Georgia state law. So uh, I can't comment on that. But you know, the likelihood of a conviction in that case, in my mind, is remote. And um, uh, I think that that comment and the actual events regarding the voir dire uh, could easily lead to a mistrial. And the next question is, would the state bring another, you know, bring another trial? Uh, and I have no idea. My guess is, in Georgia, the likelihood of that is remote. And I think, just uh, for a minute, Joe, moving up north to Wisconsin, where the other trial is going on, there's a similar situation. My recollection is that the initial, I think they selected 20 jurors up there because they had 12 plus eight, originally there were eight alternates, some of whom have dropped off for a couple of pretty bizarre reasons, as I recall. But anyway, they had dropped off, but there was only one black person on that, in that group of 20 as well. Um, so I think both of those tri both of those cases could disappear, um, and I think the likelihood of certainly in Georgia, I don't see the the uh, 
uh, state bringing another case if, in fact, you know, there's a mistrial or if there is a, uh, you know, a verdict that goes for the, def for the defendant and uh, they appeal, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think, I don't know what, 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 what would happen. But I, I think that those cases are examples of the, uh, of the issue. So to, to go back to your point, and I think it's important, what the Supreme Court decided in, in, in the uh, Scottsboro case was that, <clears throat> that the uh, defendant is um, entitled uh, to a jury which is selected without uh, um, reference to race. So, and it was left at that. There was no mention of voir dire or of preemptory um, motions, which have been a part of American jurisprudence for forever. Now, nowhere in the Constitution is there anything about preemptory motions. Um, and uh, it's one of these things that the originalists say go back to 1200 or some such year. You know, when there were a bunch of crazies running around England <laughs> killing one another. Um, and so uh, the, this peremptory opportunity raises a lot of questions. If you look at our law today, the federal rule for pre preemptory challenges is one rule, and each state has its own set of rules. So there are dozens of rules with regard to preemptory challenges. And um, these only apply in criminal cases. Um, so one of the questions that comes up is, who gets the most challenges? The prosecution or the defense? And who decides? Well, the state legislature decides, along with all the other wonderful things that they decide, uh, probably um, because you know the law would say that the defense would get X number of challenges and the uh, prosecution would get Y. Often, it's an equal number, but in many cases, it is not. And uh, so depending upon which side of the fence you may sit on, uh, you may like or not like, you know, how that falls. Uh, but that is a... Uh, 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 that is something that today is still with us. And uh, there was, a, there was a, a famous case um, where another Supreme Court case where they discussed this matter. Um, and they came up with a, um, a set of uh, three uh, rules uh, with regard to these peremptory challenges. Basically what they said was that um, <clears throat> the person who was using the peremptory challenge, if he was, if those challenges were being um, uh, uh, targeted in the appeal, had to show that, that they had non-racial reasons for using those challenges. Well, this is months, maybe years later, after the trial, right? When by the time this gets to appeal, you've had a lot of time to think about what these reasons were and to manufacture a bunch of reasons. Um, and yes, Pete. Doesn't this tonight speaking sort of as a devil's advocate, not, these are not my own personal opinions, but when you look at something like this, there has to be criteria involved in the election process. Uh, they have to be from that, that uh, political di or that district, they have to be from the state, they have to be a certain age, and there's criteria for all of these various selection processes. 
And when you say without reference to race, can that be construed to say, yes, we perhaps should have six blacks and six whites on the, uh, on the jury, but we can't just pick them because they're of color. We have to pick them because that's the prejudice that they're making the selection based on race. Well, I think it, the... It, it works. I, I, I think the problem is the, the criteria are not very carefully uh, described. Which is well, the jury of your peers, well, if you're a black guy in, in Alabama in 1930, there's not many of your peers. No, there were none of your peers. <laughs> so, right. And in fact, you know, they would, uh, in, that, in that trial, they, in that case, you know, they brought people, they, they queried people, uh, who, you know, said basically, it never occurred to us to have a black person on the jury. No, and I'm sure that was the case. And so, and so for all those years, what's that? Oh, no, no, women were out of the picture. No. Not in the 30s. They were out of the, they, they, yes. Well, so that's a very nice question. And what happens is that in the town or city or whatever the jurisdiction is, there is an administrative person, somebody who works. And part of their job is to um, manage the jury pool. What is the jury pool? Well, it's a pool of, it's, it's the voting uh, let me step back from that for a moment. It's the population of the town or city with a certain number of, you know, uh, so nobody under the age of 21 probably is, you know, in the group. Today, it would be both men and women. It might exclude people over 75 or some other such age if they thought that we were too feeble to sit on a jury, um, and, uh, but there are typically very few other educational requirements or, uh, you know, uh, any other requirements. To, to Pete's point, there really aren't any. And so what they are supposed to do is to come up with a list the judge says, I want to see 100 in the pool, or 40 in the pool, or whatever it is. Give me 100 names. So ideally, what you'd do is you'd find some way to you know, put all these balls in a, in a thing, turn it around, and pick out numbers arbitrarily. I suspect that doesn't happen in many places. Martha? That's, as I remember, is what used to happen in New York. And I think they took it off either the voting rolls or the driver's licenses. Yeah. That you were just, you were compelled to appear for jury duty. Yeah. And then there was a big thing. And when they said they needed 20 jurors, they'd just reach in a thing and start and pulling out names. Pull, pull out the names. If your name came So, I, again, it depends. Jury. Yes. OK, so if somebody is found guilty, then they can appeal, and they can use the jury as a reason why they were given a fair trial. Yes. But in this Georgia case, what if these three men aren't found um, guilty? There's double jeopardy, so they can't be tried again. Can they be tried by a federal government or, say, civil so that's by So a that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a, a very good question, and it further complicates the discussion. So let me, let me just hold that out for a second to say that that's another whole kettle of fish, the double jeopardy issue. Uh, it, it's a good question, and we'll come back to it. Um, but so my, uh, my point here is, I think it's a couple of points. One is, despite the decision back in 1935, and what's gone on since then, and there have been lots of other decisions which have been positive for minorities' participation in juries, on juries, we still have today this very same issue which uh, exists principally because of these preemptory 
challenges. It's interesting that in one of these cases back when, Thurgood Marshall uh, wrote a minority opinion in which he said there should be no preemptory challenges in a capital case. And I think that's a very interesting thought. Uh, the one thing that you had to say about Thurgood Marshall, as opposed to most of the people who sit on the Supreme Court, is that he knew what he was talking about. He had tried cases all over the country, capital cases. He knew that business inside out. Now, there's never been a real movement to eliminate the preemptory challenge, even for capital cases. There have been people who have joined Marshall's thought, but it, it certainly doesn't appear that that's likely to happen soon. George? If the preemptory challenges are exclusively to prevent blacks from being on the jury, is there a remedy for that? Well, the, sure. I mean, the remedy is you, uh, you know, you, you have a new trial. But, th so, that, so what happens? That you go back to the same place, unless the appeals court says, you know, you move the, um, you move the locus of the trial. Well, that may or may not make any difference. Uh, there was, a, in, in 2020, there was a case called Flowers versus Mississippi where the um, defendant uh, was tried for murder in a robbery. Um, and uh, the long and the short of it is he was tried six times. Six times. And uh, <clears throat> by the same prosecutor in the same county in central Mississippi. And um, <clears throat> the court, the Supreme Court, finally sent it back and said, you know, you've, the jury selection has been, uh, and he was in jail for 23 years and didn't do it. He wasn't guilty. So the court said, um, this has to be, you know, basically sent it back and said, the jury has, has been flawed in each one of these cases. You'll remember that in the case that we had this week, one of the things that Sam Leibowitz did in the Supreme Court in that case was the, one of the questions to him was, do you have any evidence that there were no black jurors on the jury rolls? And he had somehow Either he had the original rolls, or he had a copy of the rolls. I'm not sure. But he had it in his hand. And he showed it to the justices. That's very unusual in the Supreme Court. They don't look at evidence. That's not their thing. They look at documents, you know, at arguments. So, and they were shocked, because what had happened was, Somebody in the town or wherever had written in the names of six apparently black people, and it was clear that these names had been put in at a later time, et cetera. And that was really, that was a killer for the case. So, the, so if you look at the, the end of the Flowers case story is that, um, the guy who was the prosecutor for all six of these cases, over 20 some odd years, recused himself from the seventh trial. And the case went to the Attorney General of the state of Mississippi. And the Attorney General of the state of Mississippi said, upon review of all of the evidence, this guy shouldn't be in jail. And we're not bringing a case. And he was released, 
And he was pardoned in the end because they had evidence that showed that he never committed this crime to start with. And he got $500,000 from the state of Mississippi, which is the maximum penalty under the Mississippi law that can be provided to someone. It's $50,000 a year per year with a maximum of 500000 Well, he had spent 23 years in jail, but all he got was the 500000 And uh, in, in this case, in, in our case, uh, when um, you'll remember that it was uh, Norris who was the last remaining survivor of the Scottsboro Boys, and he gets pardoned in 1970. Seven, 46 years or something after this thing happened by George Wallace, of all people. George Wallace. Well, I mean, you couldn't make that up. And at the same time, there was a bill in the Alabama legislature to give Norris $10,000 for the 26 years that he spent in jail and the bill was defeated. Oh. Martha. There's cases similar in every state, virtually, in this country. And there's that guy in Wisconsin right now sitting on death row. And the parole board has voted that he should be released. And it's up to the governor. He's supposed to be executed in like eight days from now. Um, there have been cases of people who have been execu executed and later exonerated. Oh, yes. If there, there are plenty of those. Hundreds. So let me come back. And there was, there was, the question here was about double jeopardy. So let me just say a few. We could have a whole class or two on double jeopardy. Uh, but I believe it's the Fifth Amendment that says that you can't be tried twice for the same crime or put in jeopardy for the same crime. And yet we see, we saw in the Scottsboro case, these kids, and, and they were from 12 to 19, they were kids, uh, these kids were tried half a dozen times for the same crime. How does that happen? Well, <laughs> it's a long and complicated story. Basically, um, uh, I think it's, it's arguable. It's arguable that um, in cases like that, in the Flowers case that we just talked about, that uh, when the state uh, is inexorable and is pursuing these folks in some way that uh, nobody wants really to interfere. And um, I think it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's problematic. Um, and I think that it's the topic for a lot more discussion. You're perfectly right to raise it. I don't have uh, a good answer, um, but it is uh, something that uh, I think we still are, are uh, dealing with, and we're still dealing, I would suggest to you, with these peremptory challenges. We're still dealing with minorities on juries all over the country, not just in the South. Um, and this system which we operate within, which uh, you know, equal justice under law is a figment of somebody's imagination. Because it certainly isn't happening in this country. And has never happened here. Yes? In this particular case in Georgia... Uh, the the Aubrey case or the... Yeah, the Aubrey case. Yeah. If they, uh, those three men, are not found guilty, is it possible that the federal government could uh, try them for a civil rights violation? Well, they might try them for a civil rights violation, but they can't try them 
for the same crime. So that's another issue uh, because you have, in fact, the Supreme Court at one time had ruled that if you were tried by the state, you could still be charged by the feds for the same crime. That rule no longer exists. It's been overruled. So the feds can't charge you for the same crime. But they can charge you either for a different crime, uh, you know, something like that. So the answer is that's at least possible. Any other comments at this point? So let's go back uh, and talk a little bit about the details of the case. Uh, I mean, th there, when I say the case, there are so many details, I think it's hard to keep them straight. One of the things I don't know whether you picked up, Sam Leibowitz uh, was a, a very remarkable lawyer. Uh, he came out of New York, as, as I think you know, and his record on murder cases um, was extraordinary. Uh, he had tried, when he was hired to do this assignment, he had tried 78 first-degree murder cases. And he had won 77, not a single conviction, and the 78th was a mistrial. You can't do any better than that. And <clears throat> so when he lost this case, his, the first case he lost, he lost a, a lot of them down there. But when he lost the first case, it was the first murder case he had lost in something like 17 years. Um, and of course, he, <clears throat> one of the things that I think he, he didn't take into account was that all of his work had not been all in New York, but it had all been basically in the, in, you know, in the North and the Midwest. Um, and he had not, uh, he had not tried cases in the Deep South. And he didn't know what was going to hit him. And of course, what hit him, if you read some of the transcript stuff, was comments from the prosecution that this guy was a Jew lawyer and was paid for with Jew money. I mean, and Leibowitz would say, you know, I object. And, those objections were overruled, never made it to the record, um, and, and were never part of the appeal. It's interesting. Leibowitz worked for four years for these boys and didn't receive a single dime. Not a dime for no fees, and he paid most of his expenses. So. That is commitment. In the end, after he left, he was really forced to leave um, by the politics of these cases. Another thing that was very interesting and unusual about these cases, because of the time, 1930s, the US Communist Party was very active in trying to um, take up these cases as part of their political genre. <clears throat> um, and then there was the US Socialist Party, the ILD. And then there was the NAACP. There was a new organization at that time. And they were all pushing to get in here. And in the end, it was the ILD that hired Leibowitz. <coughs> Um, and so for a four-year period, he persevered. But going back to the original uh, situation, you'll recall this all happened with, it started on a freight train. I mean, this is a movie that you couldn't make up if you wanted to, with a bunch of whites and a bunch, and a bunch of blacks. These nine black boys um, teens, 12 to 19, 
Four of them knew one another. The other five didn't know the other four and didn't know one another. So there were basically, you know, there were, there were nine boys, but there were basically six parties. They, they didn't know one another. They were just all on this train. One of the boys uh, had very bad eye, eyesight, um, <clears throat> was practically blind, and was looking to, to make enough money to buy himself a pair of glasses. One of the boys had very bad venereal disease. Couldn't possibly have participated in any kind of a, a rape situation. Um, and then, of course, two of the boys were, as I say, 13, 12, 13. Um, and in any event, so they get off, the, the, when they get off this train. Were they uh, in the freight car or were they in the passenger car? No, there were no passenger cars. This was an all a freight train. Yeah. And. I'm sorry? The two women were on the freight train? Yes. That's right. They were all on the freight train. There were no passenger cars. One of the interesting things that Leibowitz did was, he, and I think you saw this, he had a model built of the train by the Lionel Company. And that was what he used in court when he was uh, trying to, to break Victoria Price's testimony. Uh, not successfully, actually. But there were no passenger cars on this train. These were all hobos, white hobos and black hobos. And they were all just traveling along. And the two women, who were dressed basically in men's clothes, <clears throat> um, were just another part of this group. And w it would appear that when they all got off, at, uh, what was it, what's the name of this little town? Rock Paint or some strange name for the, for the, for the, uh... Paint Rock. Paint Rock, thank you. Paint Rock, um, a metropolis in, uh, in, in Alabama. Uh, there was a posse there um, uh, waiting for them. Uh, they were arrested on minor charges of basically, you know, kind of being a hobo, disturbing the peace, whatever. And then these two gals get off the train. And they're scared to death that they're going to be arrested. They've already been arrested many times in different places for various things. They didn't want to get arrested again. So their decision was, in order to refrain from being arrested, we got to make up a story. We'll say that we were raped by these guys, which of course is what happened. And then the whole incredible story really begins. And uh, they arrest these boys, they put them in jail. The sheriff, for reasons that are not clear, uh, decides that he needs to move these boys. Uh, or no, he, I guess he didn't move them. He brought in, he brought in guards from uh, neighboring towns because he was afraid these guys were going to be hanged, were going to be lynched. To his credit, for that moment. And then the first trial starts like a week later, and they have these trials: bang, 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 bang. And the next thing you know, the eight uh, guys, eight of the nine are sentenced to death for rape. Um, and the ninth is uh, sentenced uh, to uh, life imprisonment because he was, quote unquote, a minor. Um, and uh, then we have the, uh, the second uh, series of uh, cases. Um, the, the, one of the things that happened here, which again is unusual, is that these, this story was picked up by the national press. First of all, you had the ILD, the Communist Party, the NAACP, the ACLU, which was kind of on the sidelines, 
Everybody's talking about this case. It's on the pages of papers everywhere. And uh, so it's getting a lot of press. And they appeal then to the Alabama Supreme Court. The Alabama Supreme Court gives its usual, you know, everything is fine. Don't worry about this. And then uh, they take it to uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, in the meantime, of course, the boys remain in jail. The conditions in the jail were unspeakable. Uh, these were jail cells that had been condemned, uh, that no one had stayed in in years. Uh, I'm sure that we can't even imagine uh, the conditions that uh, these kids were in and the way they were treated or not treated, as the case might be. And then we had a second round of trials. And then there was a third round of trials. And uh, Mr. Leibowitz uh, had come in for the second round, and um, we saw the wheels of justice turning ever so slowly, um, which I think is something that we see very commonly today. Um, so, and have always seen. They just don't move very fast. Um, so, uh, I think that um, why, don't we, why don't we take a break here? Um, I have about 10 to 1. Uh, let's break until 1 o'clock. We'll come back and um, kind of uh, go through, I think, the highlights. There are some, I think, interesting highlights here uh, of how, this, how these um, uh, what happened to these boys uh, individually, collectively, what impact this had uh, on our society. Um, there, uh, in 1932, Mother's Day, 1932, there was a Mother's March on Washington, D.C. 5,000 people in 1932, in the middle of the Depression on Mother's Day. Six of the boys' mothers uh, were there and uh, went to the White House uh, with a group of well-known white intellectuals. It's the best way I can. Theodore Dreiser and a bunch of other writers, performers, artists went. And they were denied admittance the president um, had had prior warning of their coming. This was Mother's Day. This was Hoover. President no, no, it was Roosevelt. Roosevelt. It was Roosevelt. And uh, he was out sailing on the Potomac for the day. And there had been a, a luncheon schedule for his mother. Very important person in the president's life which never happened because he was out on the Potomac. And they basically stonewalled. They had a petition they were trying to uh, give to the president. They were told to come back the next day, which they did. And the uh, president uh, actually, uh, they were told the president was too busy, of course, to see them. But they did accept the petition. And some weeks later, uh, there was a letter from the Attorney General of the United States saying to the effect, this is Alabama's problem, not the problem of the United States. So uh, I think that's something we've heard before, and I think it's something we're going to hear again. Uh, anyway, so let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 and go from there. Thank you. So one of the things I wanted to mention before I forget, the, the key witness in this case, you'll remember, was this one of the girls, one of the women, they were young girls, they were in their early 20s, uh, was Victoria Price. And uh, she was the one who, in the very first trial, 
um, uh, had the uh, room in stitches when she was talking about, when I say the room, I mean the courtroom, in stitches when she was talking about uh, the rapes and how they happened. And uh, she was making a big joke out of all of this. Um, and uh, then in the second series of cases, when Leibowitz uh, came in, uh, she testified on direct about 14 minutes because she had told this story already a fair number of times. And he had her on the stand for four and a half hours uh, trying to uh, break her direct testimony. But uh, he really wasn't able to make much of a dent. And in fact, uh, what happened was that, I mean, the courtroom was jammed with spectators uh, and press. And really what happened was these trials became, for the people of Alabama, an attack against women in the South. And uh, the fact that these ladies were not typical of women's in the, women in the South, which I think is a fair comment. Uh, so <clears throat> they also, uh, the, the uh, Leibowitz also brought um, a, uh, uh, a <clears throat> witness to the stand who testified that he and a friend of his had had sexual relations with these ladies the night before the, 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 the train run. Described the event, the time, the place, how it happened, and that was the reason why they had uh, the remains of some uh, semen. Uh, and um, the doctor who examined the girls after the rape said there was no evidence of any scratches, any forced entry. There wasn't any unusual amount of semen. In fact, uh, the semen that was there was not alive. So that indicated that the testimony of the guy who they had picked up originally was probably accurate. In any event, uh, she became the kind of notorious one, Victoria Price. And Many years later, uh, many years later, um, she accused, she brought a lawsuit against NBC, accusing them of defaming her in, some, in a film that they had made about the trial. And she sued them for $6 million, claiming that there was slander and invasion of privacy. Uh, this is 46 years after the event. So uh, the judge, it was a federal judge in uh, Winchester, Tennessee, threw the case out of court. Then she appealed this to the federal appeals court uh, in early 81, uh, which upheld the district court two to one. And uh, the real question here was whether she was still a person of public interest. Because if she was, then she had no case. But if the 46 years had changed her status, then it was arguable, at least, that maybe uh, she did have a case. And her lawyer, I don't know who it was, uh, appealed the case to the Supreme Court of the United States um, on the issue of whether she was still a public figure. Yes, Martha? Would it matter, could you argue that she had been a public figure at the time and the movie was about her at that time? I'm sure that was, I'm sure that could be part of the argument, yes. Um, but this was still an open and perhaps interesting question. 
And so uh, in uh, December of 1981, before the Supreme Court took up the case, there was an announcement in the paper that NBC had settled this case with Victoria Price Street, that was apparently her, ma her married name, for an undisclosed amount, terms undisclosed. And the only other thing I can say is that she died early in 1982, just a few months after the settlement. Uh, so I have no idea how much she got. I'm sure it was more money than she ever saw in her life. I'm sure her lawyer took a substantial portion of what it was that she uh, uh, settled for. But in any event, uh, that's uh, how, she, um, how she wound up. Uh, the, the other girl? The other girl kind of disappeared, Ruby, Ruby Bates. She was the quiet one. She was the one who changed her statement in the second round of cases. The, the, the story was that she had been influenced by Victoria Price. She was a much quieter girl. She had grown up in somewhat different circumstances. And uh, Leibowitz, um, what happened was Ruby Bates disappeared, actually disappeared from view for six months. Nobody knew where she was. Uh, I think what happened was that um, uh, Leibowitz and his people found her, took her to New York, completely out of, the, out of the picture here, and then brought her down as the last witness in the trial for Leibowitz's first uh, trial after you know, winning the case uh, in the uh, Supreme Court. And she testified that she had lied on the stand. Um, two problems developed. One, she was all dressed up in kind of fancy New York finery, which clearly somebody hadn't paid any attention to. Uh, that certainly wasn't going to fly in Decatur, Alabama, or wherever this <clears throat> new trial was. And second of all, she did not hold up well on cross-examination. And uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, I think those two things combined. Um, but she disappeared, basically, at some point midway through this and kind of fell into I don't think anybody really knows. Um, so one of the things that happened here, or didn't happen, was the issues, the issue of surrounding the possible pardons of these boys, uh, these defendants. Remember, there were nine of them. Um, and they were all sentenced to death originally, except the one who was the youngest. Uh, then they were all resentenced to death, I think twice, uh, in the next two rounds. Uh, and then there were issues, as I say, of should they be, because it was clear, let me put it this way, the facts seemed clear to many that this, was, this whole thing had been a made up and that uh, these boys were not guilty of this crime. Um, and so they, there were all kinds of machinations to try and get them pardoned. And this had to do with uh, the relationship between Leibowitz and the prosecutors. And this had to do with the ILD and the communists and the NAA. Everybody was involved in this effort. Uh, there were governors of California, there were, uh, excuse me, of Alabama, there were parole board members, uh, there were prosecutors. It was, it was really a mess. At one time, Leibowitz uh, had a deal, he thought, with the prosecutor, um, and um, uh, 
they took it to the, the prosecutor went back, took it to the governor, and the governor refused to sign the deal, and the whole thing fell apart. Eventually, Leibowitz had to move away from these cases because uh, he had offended so many people uh, in the uh, Alabama piece uh, that part of any deal they would make was that he would go away. And so there were a series of trials where he actually attended but was not arguing the case. That must have been very difficult for someone of his mean and stature. But anyway, in 1937, four of the boys were pardoned. Four out of nine. So uh, they all went to New York where they were welcomed. Leibowitz had organized a welcoming party. The Hippodrome in New York, which was the big theater then, 4,500 people at the Hippodrome uh, welcoming these young men uh, to New York. Um, there were dozens of commercial offers that came in for these kids. I don't know what they were. I've never seen them. But that's what the texts say. But for reasons that I'm not clear of, uh, Leibowitz didn't want them to take any of these commercial offers. Um, and uh, he had organized a speaking tour for them. Now remember, these were kids who were uneducated. These were not professional speakers. They had spent the last six and a half, seven years in a terrible place. So in any event, they went on this tour uh, around parts of the country. Uh, they were paid a modest sum. The tour was quite successful. They attracted lots of people. During this time, there were um, demonstrations in England, in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, in Berlin, in 1937. Unbelievable. But again, these were stirred up by left-wing uh, people who were anxious to uh, make this a cause celeb and uh, have uh, reasons uh, to um, support the boys and, of course, at the same time make uh, a political statement. So uh, they were pardoned by the then governor of Alabama. So, but it was very interesting. You now had four boys who had been pardoned and five who were still in jail on exactly the same evidence. How do you possibly explain that? And of course the answer is you don't. I mean, there's no, you know, I decided A instead of B and D instead of F and, you know, that's just, that's what parole boards can do if they choose to do it. Maybe. Yes? Was it the youngest who were pardoned? Well, uh, a couple of the youngest were, but it wasn't just age. Um, and uh, there were, so I think they felt that the ones who had been the quote unquote toughest, whatever that means, whatever that meant to them. Um, and I think Patterson, who was the oldest, and who was the last one uh, to be, I think at one point, because there's another round of pardons some years later, and four more of the boys are pardoned, and Patterson is the only one left. And I believe he was the oldest one, and he was the one who um, the guards, you know, beat up on the most. I think he was the biggest. And, had yeah. the, prior <clears throat> the only one that actually had some sort of record. I don't remember whether he had a prior record or not, but he was the not oldest a one. Serious record. But that's possible. So um, uh, anyway, so um, I want to kind of
come back to uh, these are still fogging up on me. I know I'm doing something wrong. Either that or my eyes are, are, are going. So uh, kind of So kind of moving this forward, um, oh, uh, Patterson uh, escapes from a chain gang in 1948. Um, and he goes to, De because he was the last one left, he goes to Detroit where his, uh, I think, sister, and he had some family there. Um, and um, he's arrested there by the FBI and, uh, because he was wanted by the state of Alabama. But the state of Alabama needed the governor of Michigan to agree to extradite. And the governor of Michigan in those days was, I don't know whether you remember, G. Men and Williams. Soapy, as they used to call him, because his family was the Men and Soap family. And Soapy, to his credit, refused to, ex to extradite Patterson. And so basically, that was kind of the end of uh, Alabama's uh, attempt uh, to bring him back. In 1950, uh, a book called uh, uh, The Scottsboro Boys was published. Uh, later in that year, uh, Patterson was arrested in Michigan in a barroom brawl. He was charged with first degree murder in May of 1951. There was a hung jury. Uh, a few months later, there was a second trial, which was a mistrial. And he was tried again three more times. Uh, and he finally got sentenced uh, to 6 to 15 years for manslaughter. Um, when they put him in jail, they found that he had contacted, he had contracted cancer, and he died in jail at the age of 39 years old, uh, having spent virtually all of his adult life uh, in a penitentiary. Uh, Clarence Norris, who was the, actually the last of the survivors of the boys, uh, <clears throat> after his parole, uh, he goes to New York and he pops in on Judge Leibowitz. At that point, Leibowitz had become, he was a judge at the appellate court level in New York, and he eventually became a justice of the New York Supreme Court, where he served for many years. Uh, anyway, Norris walks in on him unexpectedly, um, and uh, there's a kind of a big reunion, um, and uh, uh, Leibowitz reached out to try and help him uh, obtain employment uh, to do whatever he could uh, in those, uh, uh, you know, whatever he was able to do. And then one day uh, in 1973, 74, Norris, who's still living in New York and who still has never been pardoned, picks up the phone, and he calls the governor's office in Montgomery, Alabama. And the governor is George Wallace. And he's not talking to Wallace, but he starts this conversation. And it led to more conversation. And eventually, it led to uh, his being pardoned, as I said, uh, by Wallace. Uh, in 1976, I think it was. Um, and he goes to Alabama uh, for the pardon. Uh, 
Um, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, that was uh, the uh, kind of, and then the last act really of all of this is that in 2013, there are still three of the nine boys who have either not been pardoned or whose convictions were never formally overturned. And the governor then, whose name I don't remember, uh, agreed um, to pardon the remaining three uh, boys who were now all gone. This was all posthumous. Um, and so that was the end of this saga from 1931 uh, all the way uh, to 2013. Yes, Larry. A question, Maynard. Uh, was the first legal proceeding against the nine boys, whatever it was, a trial? A trial. They, they were all on the, in the dock at once? No, they were not. They were, uh, they were, they were a couple of, there were, I think, three trials. The, the, the youngest was tried separately. And then uh, they, they deliberately decided to, to try them separately um, so that, uh, uh, anyway, so the next series of trials, they were tried, I think, individually for the most part. But originally, I believe there were three trials f the first time around. And... Uh, what they would do is they'd, you know, they'd run them together in the sense that they would, for example, have a verdict coming in, guilty, death penalty, everybody cheering, and they'd go directly into the trial of the next defendant. You know, this was not, this was like a, a football game, not a, uh, you know, not a trial. <clears throat> um, with the same jury? No, not with the same jury, uh, but the same type of jury. Didn't they initially all have the same public defender? Didn't they initially have a public defender? So, well, they initially, in the very first trials, the, uh, they had, there were two um, uh, lawyers for the defense. One, the mothers of some of the boys had gotten together and they found a lawyer in Tennessee who was willing to come over to Alabama. He turned out to be a drunk <laughs> and he had never been in a courtroom in Alabama. So that was not a good sign. And then the court appointed a lawyer to work with him, uh, who also was not qualified. And that was actually one of the bases of the appeal, because the first case was appealed on the basis of inadequate representation, not on blacks and juries. That came later. They could have appealed that way as well, but the first appeal was inadequate defense. And uh, so I think they said that uh, the lawyer met with the boys uh, for 30 minutes before the trial. So, you know, that'll give you an idea of what kind of representation they had. Um, and he also, they met with him in the jail with all nine of them in the room and there was a sheriff's deputy there listening to everything that was going on. I mean, as I say, you can't make this stuff up, but that's, uh, um, those are just some of the things that actually had transpired. So, um, I think that, uh, you know, this story uh, is 
an incredible summary in kind of one big messy box uh, of some of the things that our justice system has struggled with for many, many years and continues to struggle with. We all read stories every day, see things on television every day. People who have been sentenced, who have been tried, convicted, sentenced, who either uh, was not done properly or in many cases uh, where they're innocent uh, and DNA and other means have been used to establish that. Uh, but we continue to, f to fight uh, and to, uh, I think, be frustrated by uh, these kinds of uh, activity. So, so these capital cases are basically one kind of case. But you know there's a lot of other cases, a lot of other crime, a lot of other felonies, misdemeanors that are going on that we don't hear about because they're not as important. Of course, they're important to the people who are being charged or who were being, who had been hurt by these cases. So I want to, this is a, a personal situation. I don't know whether any of you have ever had this experience. I hope not. But uh, my father passed away um, <clears throat> on Super Bowl Sunday in 1997. I remember it very well for many reasons. I was actually on an airplane in the morning flying down to uh, Boca Raton to see him. Uh, and he passed when I was on the flight. It was before the time of cell phones. And anyway, when I got off the plane, I saw a friend of mine who was waiting for me who happened to be in the funeral business. And I knew he wasn't waiting there just by chance. And sure enough, uh, my father had passed. So um, long story short, um, my mother had passed a few years before. My father had a, um, a friend, a lady who uh, had, he had known for many years, who had been a friend of the family's, who he was seeing. And she was at the apartment that night before uh, in a separate room. And she came in and found him, called the police, and uh, that was that. So during the course of my discussions with Phyllis, she said to me, you know something interesting? Uh, your dad went to the bank on Friday and withdrew $1,000. And uh, she said, you know, we, uh, we went out Saturday night and, you know, he used his credit card. And uh, I noticed, you know, after the police had come and gone, that uh, there was no money next to his bed. So um, I said, that was odd. I, I actually went to the, uh, his car where the receipt you know, for the withdrawal was. So to make a long story short, I filed a complaint with the Boca Raton police. And uh, the experience was quite remarkable um, in this respect. So the first thing, of course, is that there was no way that anybody in the police department could possibly have taken this money. Um, and that uh, there had been some firemen there and some EMT guys and, you know, it must have been or may have been them. And then they said to me, you know, I think that the, I don't remember what rank he is, but the policeman or detective said to me, I think probably Phyllis took the money. So, <laughs> I mean, I'd known this woman for 30 years. She had plenty of money and she didn't need the thousand dollars. So I know she didn't take the money. So um, I didn't 
really respond except to say I didn't think that was possible. Anyway, we made the arrangements, brought my father back to Boston, had the, the, uh, uh, the funeral. And a few days later, I get a phone call from Phyllis's son-in-law, who was someone who I had known. He wasn't my best friend, but somebody I had known. And he said to me, you have to do something about this charge that you've brought. The police have brought Phyllis in four times to interrogate her about this thousand dollars. It's driving her crazy. And the only thing that we can do is to have you withdraw the charge. So I called my friend in the funeral business. He had been in the business for 40 years. It was a big business, uh, his father-in-law's business. Uh, he had gone to Harvard, where he had graduated magna, Phi Beta Kappa, so he was not stupid. I said to him, Bob, because I had told him the story. What's the story with this? Oh, he said, this happens all over the country, everywhere. It's a huge scam. It's been going on forever. Old people who pass, many pass alone or, you know, with someone else who's in a different room or whatever, and things disappear all the time. The easiest thing to disappear is money, because that can't be traced. And uh, so uh, I, you know, I did a little research. I discovered by talking to a number of other people, this is, in fact, a very common thing. Whether you're in the west or the east, the north or the south, whether you're in a big city or whether you're in a small town, it's part of the game. So I mention this uh, because it's another very small um, unpleasantness that we wind up living with. Because when you think about it, there really is nothing you can do about this. Um, we don't have cameras in every room to show what's going on. Uh, you can't accuse every policeman or fireman or EMT guy. I remember Bob said to me, you know, if they're all there, it's very easy. You know, they just split up the money. I mean, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. And of course, jewelry is something else that disappears as well. So for whatever it's worth, I, you know, uh, you can't, um, uh, bulletproof yourself in any way about this, but it's a very unfortunate uh, um, factual thing that, you know, uh, we experienced personally many years ago. And I've heard, as I've told the story occasionally to others, and I, I do know some people who have had similar experiences. So, uh, anyway, yes, Joe. My assumption is that uh, what you just described is attributable to a power differential. And I would say the same applies when you're talking about race. In a number of these cases, race is, is at the center. Yes. It is uh, in the final analysis of power differential. I mean, you were rendered powerless <coughs> by their uh, behavior, and they're digging their heels in, Volker Raton, and your friend was paying the price. And the only reason you re-intervened is because it was so unpleasant for her. Correct. But it's basically a power differential, isn't it? Well, I think that's certainly one thing you could call it. I mean, you know, it's interesting. If Phyllis hadn't been involved, I'm not sure if there hadn't been anybody else there, I'm not sure how that might have been resolved. You know, uh, I have no idea. How, I would, how, how seriously I would have pursued this. You know, I'm in Boston. The police are down in Boca Raton. How much money am I going to spend to collect 
a few dollars from somebody who says I didn't do it, maybe in the end it would have been, you know, I would have walked away anyway. Isn't, isn't there relative impunity uh, based on the fact they know how they can explain things and essentially deflect you? It's uh, not unlike uh, a policeman in a confrontation for a taillight saying, I fear for my life, yep. which is what you hear all the time. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's known to black people, and they are surprised that we're not surprised. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good way to put it. Surprised that we're not surprised, right. Yeah, yes, Mark. when you withdrew the charge? Does it mean that it didn't exist? Does it mean No, it doesn't mean that it, it didn't exist. It just means that I'm not willing to pursue it. I either changed my mind, I, uh, I basically said, you know, uh, do what you want with it, but, you know, I, I'm out. And did they then leave Phyllis alone? They did. They did. They did. Uh, because there was no charge and, uh, for, you know. But I'm, I think it was four times in just a couple of days that they had. So, uh, and, you know, and this is not to say that all police officers, there are wonderful police officers. Uh, we have not good friends, but friends of very good friends. Bill Bratton, uh, who was the commissioner of police in Boston, in New York twice, in LA, uh, and his wife, uh, Ricky, who's a commentator on the news, on uh, legal matters, Ricky Clayman, uh, are people who we've spent some time with. And so I've talked to Bill about some of these things, and he acknowledges, you know, that these are problems, and you know, they're probably insurmountable in a sense of being able to. But in talking to him, one of the things that I learned is that there are always, just like any other profession, there are a few rotten apples in the barrel. Uh, the problem with the police is, and to a, perhaps a little lesser extent with the firemen and the EMTs, is that what they do is so important in terms of people's lives and expectations that just a few makes it a lot different than having a few rotten apples in, a, in some other kind of a barrel. I don't want to single out any other profession or job, because that's not the point. But clearly, these people in public safety are out on the front lines, and their importance is. Uh, so, and, and actually that, that, again, this is not a direct line, but remember I, we talked about the Flowers versus Mississippi case, the guy who was charged six times, um, and not charged, he was tried six times. And then I said that the district attorney recused himself from the seventh trial and the attorney, well, where is that district attorney now? And the answer is, he's still the district attorney. He's run since then twice unopposed. So uh, I think that's the kind of uh, reaction that we get today from uh, the general public. And uh, yes, Pete. Another addition to that same story, I was the mayor of a small town in Delaware, we fired our police chief for malfeasance, and, and we got a very strong case, complete facts for everything. Yep. And he sued the town for $75,000, which is, you know, we're going to court. And I called the lawyer, the town lawyer, who in touch with the insurance company that the town uses for their yep. umbrella. And we were told, don't take it to court, pay the 75, it's cheaper. Oh. And, and the town could go ahead without without our insurance. Right. Which would be a really stupid thing to do. Yep. <laughs> or, or, or not. Or not. So yeah. uh, <clears throat> these games, I don't know that we, I'm not trying to no. hate lawyers. No, no. With Dave staring at me here, uh, <laughs> with police chiefs, <laughs> but right. the, the games that are played within the law are, 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 are right. And I think that's a that's an excellent, 
an excellent example. There's no question that the insurance aspects of all of this. I mean, I'm sure that's why NBC settled with, uh, uh, what's her name, Price? Price Street, with Victoria. You know, the answer was they had now taken it through two, you know, two courts. They had probably spent a fair amount of money fussing with this thing. What they paid was probably a pittance. Yeah, they, they, NBC couldn't find that money, you know, in their side pocket. I mean, it was just nothing. So it was cheaper to have it go away. And uh, I think that's what, yes, Except Mark. that some of the lawyers who I worked with at NBC in the news part of it would argue that every time the company settled a case like that, they that contributed it, to eroding the power of the, I think that's, the entity to claim right. that they had that, fair that, use or right. you know, the right. truth behind it. So, um, Joe. Isn't the settlement paid by the insurance company? I'm sorry? Isn't the settlement paid by the insurance company and not NBC? Well, yes, but that, that would typically result in, uh, you know, a raise in, in rates. I mean, that suit may not have, but... No, but I mean, but I mean that the, uh, the decision weighs <coughs> the, uh, by the insurance company. Well, but I think the publicity that NBC settled, that's what gets out to the public. Not that they didn't pay or that the insurance company paid or something like well, that. Well, and, and, and future plaintiffs. Yes. Well, the public. Right. Future plaintiffs. So, again. Um, this, is, this is a little off this immediate subject, but uh, since starting these classes, uh, Mayor, I came across a profile of Eric Bell. And uh, I subsequently bought his book of essays, yes. which uh, present a very strong case. This is a black Harvard Law School professor who died some time ago. Yep. His, his uh, belief, which he carried throughout his life and espoused in his, in his <clears throat> legal writings, as well as his book of essays, he essentially said that racial prejudice in the United States was endemic. It's always there, and it's like anthrax below the surface. This is an analogy he uses, but I use it. It's like anthrax spores beneath the surface, which rise when the conditions are right. Comment? No, well, I think this goes back to critical race theory and, and that whole topic, which I don't, I mean, anybody who watches television today who saw the race in Virginia, uh, you know, uh, where there's a lot of conversation about this, uh, and that's perhaps a whole other class. Uh, and um, but uh, yeah, Bell was uh, uh, known for that. I think he was a, an excellent writer, um, and I think he expressed he expressed himself very well. I certainly feel, and I think that. If we look at this case, that whether or not, leaving aside the whole issue of critical race theory, uh, that if we look at voting rights and the history of voting rights, uh, just all by itself, and of course it impinges on lots of other things, it's clear that we are moving backwards in this area, and the likelihood of our of I think Congress passing one of the existing bills, at least at this point, seems to me to be remote. The only way that's going to happen is to bust the filibuster, uh, at least to have a carve out for voting rights or whatever. And I, uh, you know, I'm not <coughs> hopeful. Uh, I'm not, uh, I am hopeful. I'm not, um, uh, I'm not optimistic. Thank you. I'm not optimistic that that's going to happen. And I think that that single fact is so important that it could really change the whole uh, concept uh, of our democracy. I, I read this morning in the Valley News that our good legislature is doing its work redistricting the 435 
characters who are sitting down there, and I know there are some people here who used to sit down there, so I cast no aspersions. But, you know, uh, I live in Grantham, and this conversation suddenly, you know, we have just about enough people in Grantham to have our own representative. We've always been kind of the tail end of another district. So, uh, and, and this is just, you know, we got a million three hundred thousand people in, in New Hampshire. I mean, this is just, and now they're redistricting the congressional district so that, you know, we're going to have one Democrat and one Republican. So, uh, these problems are endemic. They're going to be with us for a long time. Uh, 2022 is going to tell a very interesting story. And, if I might, that leads into kind of my closing uh, pitch, my uh, sales pitch, for those of you who are around and who are interested, is that in January, uh, I think we're going to be right back here uh, for four weeks uh, for the Biden era, a report card, and a prognosis for the primary. So I would, if you're interested, I hope you'll give us consideration. Uh, and I hope you'll uh, think about that in the spring. I've got two uh, courses lined up. One is just two weeks, The Power of Billboards, which I think is a very interesting topic. And I think for two sessions, we can <clears throat> talk about the Sitco sign and, and Kenmore Square and some other some other disasters that I can recall. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, which I've entitled Wither the Supreme Court, uh, which I have serious concerns about. Yes, Miss Ginia? If you are running the world, <laughs> <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> what would you decide about the Supreme Court uh, how they should be appointed, uh, how long they should serve, et cetera. But in other words, what restrictions, what parameters? Well, you know, uh, I'm going to answer it this way. Um, one, come back and see us <laughs> in the spring. Two, the Biden Commission is, a, I think, in a couple of months, six weeks, going to issue a report. I have, I don't know what they're doing, really. It's been, you know, I have little hope that that's going to lead to anything. But I think that will be a question. Not what I would do, but what is doable, realistically, in the class in the spring. Uh, you know, is there anything uh, that we can do, we as a country can do? Uh, and uh, um, I think that's a, a very tough chestnut. A very tough chestnut. Would you take an amendment to get it done? Well, yeah, but an amendment is, you know, the last, am last time we did an amendment, I mean, we were barely alive. Um, you know, there have been so few of them. And I, I just don't see states today approving an amendment of any kind. And that is such, the idea that the court is not political is ridiculous. So, uh, so if you start with that assumption, you know, uh, it's hard to step back and say, you know, uh, whatever. But uh, I think that, I think one of the questions uh, that's, that's very interesting uh, is what I describe as the politics of leaving. How the justices decide to leave the court. You know, on the one hand, we have RBG, who decided to die. I mean, no, that was a, she made that decision. She wasn't going to leave the court. On the other hand, we have Justice Kennedy, who some people would suggest, you know, wanted to do Trump a huge favor uh, and was successful in so doing. Or was bribed. And I'm not going to say that. At least right now. So, so I think uh, if you go back in history to how the justices have left or not left, to me it's very interesting. I have, 
you know, I served on a, on a committee with Justice Breyer for a couple of years. We met eight or nine times. It was a large committee. Uh, I was very impressed with, it was with regard to the design and construction of the new federal, what was then, the new federal courthouse on Boston Harbor. And I thought he was great. I had an opportunity to see him in his office twice in DC, which was also very interesting. Um, but I am distressed at his reluctance to step down. And uh, I can only attribute it to what I think happens to a lot of people on the court, is they are so impressed with their importance that they don't want to leave. It's the greatest job in the world. So um, anyway, I think this is this is all this is all. Well, <coughs> well. What, what's that? Oh, was it Souter was right? I mean, you know, I don't think he ever liked the job. He did it, you know. I mean, he was ideal in some ways. Uh, because he did his job for X number of years, he got up and he left, and that was the end of it. He didn't like Washington. And no, we didn't like. Well, I can understand that. I mean, if <laughs> if you're, I mean, Washington's a great city, but if you're inside the Beltway working on all that stuff, there's a lot not to like. Um, yes, Martha. I think that uh, Mitch McConnell uh, denying Obama that seat and then pushing through Amy Coney just uh -oh. just yeah. raises the question of congressional abuse of the class, <coughs> off the process. Well, we, you know, the, the, <laughs> so I, I think all of these questions are, you know, kind of all very interesting. Uh, what I think what we should do is rent a room and a bar somewhere. <laughs> Maybe we'll have, you know, a little soft jazz in the background. We'll get Jim to play his sax or something. And, uh, you know, just kind of mellow out and talk about some of these really important issues. And, you know, I mean, uh, if we can't fix it, who can? <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you very much for coming for these past six weeks. I certainly have enjoyed coming back. And this has refreshed my memory and my enthusiasm for being in person. I hope it's done the same for you, and I look forward to seeing you.